When I was a freshman at NYU, I suddenly realized that all of the French my college prep school had attempted to teach me from elementary through graduation had given me virtually no practical understanding of the language. Surprisingly, I declared my French major the next year. But I continued to struggle with a kind of mental block towards speaking my second language. No matter how many vocab words I memorized or how many verb tenses I could conjugate. I wondered why it was so difficult for me to become comfortable with speaking a second language when I was surrounded by so many people who spoke two or three or more, as if it was nothing. At night, I eavesdropped while my bilingual suite mates spoke on the phone to their parents, talking in Russian, Mandarin, and Japanese, but interjecting English words or idioms from time to time. The switches were random and apparently effortless, as if they had no awareness or discrimination between the two languages in the moment. It became apparent that they must be capable of thinking in both languages at once. I later found out that this alternation in the multilingual mind has been referred to as code switching for some time. The theory of code switching says that multilinguals have distinct and separate language codes in their minds, and these can be used in the same way that a light switch is turned on and off. But this suggests that the changes are deliberate and planned, which didn't seem to be the case with my bilingual suite mates. They spoke quickly and casually in a continuous flow. Newer research on an idea called translanguaging instead suggests that multilinguals communicate using one big mixed stockpile of all their languages, subconsciously pulling out puzzle pieces from this vast linguistic network in order to form cohesive ideas as they speak. As I thought about my multilingual suite mates speaking, I had to wonder, what was so different about the way that they had learned language and the way that I had? Well, it was clear. From the beginning, they had a fluid idea of language, and they had had the opportunity to experiment with letting their languages be in conversation with one another. They spoke English at school and another language at home, but neither language had ever been off limits. For me, language was always very separate. I spoke foreign language in a classroom, and outside, in the real world, foreign language never touched the rest of my life. With all of this in mind, I started to ponder the possibility of transferring this translanguaging idea to the text of a children's book. Bilingual educators tend to avoid mixing languages for fear that the vocab and grammar may get mixed up between the languages. However, a study conducted specifically on bilingual children's books by Raymond Sneddon in 2008 showed that a productive transfer may actually occur between languages as the meanings of words in both languages are negotiated. In addition, it's becoming more and more clear that second language learning not only helps critical thinking and analytical skills, but also improve understanding of the second language, of the first language. Here's what I know. It's hard to learn a second language after a certain age, especially so many years after first language acquisition. If we are able to introduce multiple languages at an earlier age through engaging and entertaining visually oriented means, children may have a better shot at achieving equal mastery across languages. I propose to do this by alternating between languages in the text of children's books and using illustrations as a visual translation. Current bilingual books attempt to bring languages together by placing direct translations side by side, but this only results in a story that tends to read a bit like a textbook. It fails to engage the reader because of the opportunity it provides to rely solely on the native language. To me, this is like watching a foreign film, but reading the subtitles the whole way through, and missing out on the important parts of the visual action and expression. In an attempt to turn off the subtitles in bilingual children's literature, I developed the illustration-based translanguaging book. 
The current model, which I both wrote and illustrated, switches from French to English, from sentence to sentence, and sometimes page to page. Any word that is used in English is used in French later in a different context, and vice versa. The reader is to use their existing knowledge in their native language in addition to the helpful accompanying images in order to work through the unknown words in their foreign language. As a fluidly multilingual object, the book can be collectively read or used for autonomous learning in which case the students have the opportunity to employ interlanguage or their own approximation of the target language, experimenting with and self-correcting without the open instruction or influence of a teacher. The student is able to do this because of the detail and the interest that the illustrations add to the text. If we begin to think of language as a more fluid concept, we could even say that the illustrations are the third language of the book, and a helpful one at that, considering that images are universal language that allow for a collective experience. The illustrations not only serve as a visual translation, but they also bridge cultural differences and attempt to address certain social issues, whether global or specific, to France and the United States. It may be as simple as the different escargot shape of hopscotch in France or as crucial as diversity and acceptance. Because the illustrations are the explanatory component of the book, the text should be understandable for both learners of English as a second language and learners of French as a second language. In theory, this model can be applied to any combination of two languages, putting both words and cultures in conversation with one another right before the eyes of the young learner. Now, I don't live with the same sweet mates anymore, but my roommate this year is also bilingual. When she FaceTimes with her mom, I pop my head in her room and say, Ni hao, ma. <laughs> and her mom always appreciates my attempt at good Mandarin intonation. The other day, my roommate and I were in a cab together, and she called her mom to catch up. I was listening, but um, I don't really know Mandarin, and so it sounded as all foreign language tends to sound, a bit like Charlie Brown's teacher. Wah, 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 wah. <laughs> but I did know that in general, they were having a conversation about face cream, because this happened to be the one English word that she was using. It was a kind of goofy thing to listen to, because she was just saying cream, about every third word for several sentences, and it was the only word I could understand. Always curious and excited to see translanguaging in live action, I asked my roommate when she got off the phone why she used this one English word. She said, I don't know. You see, to her, there's nothing out of the ordinary about mixing languages. Both of her parents speak Mandarin and English, so she could speak in one or the other, but they've always just used both. She grew up in Hong Kong with one Taiwanese and one American parent and started going to British International School at age eight. Because of all of these factors, her cultural and linguistic worlds were always very integrated. And she never experienced that separation between home and school language that has the power to alienate and isolate. But what about the children of families who immigrate to the US? How can they both honor the tradition of their native language and continue to become more comfortable with speaking English? They lead Hannah Montana lives of speaking English at school and another language at home, sometimes with parents who haven't yet learned English or prefer the child to only speak in the native language. What they need is a common ground, a textual and visual object to help them unite these seemingly disparate cultural worlds. These translanguaging books could help the Korean speaker growing up in San Francisco, the Spanish speaker going to first grade in San Antonio, and so on. Language is an integral part of identity, and picture books give us a unique opportunity to show children how communication can unlock so many parts of the world through connection and understanding. 
I created this book because I had to so something to say about both speaking and listening. I speak only two languages, well, maybe one and a half, but I consider myself fluent in curiosity. And the question that I'm most eager to ask you today is this. How can you make your ideas speak a language that everyone understands? Xie xie, merci, and thank you.